BioBalance HealthCast, episode 164, Near-Death Experiences and Dying. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast. Uh, about 20 Five years ago, I read a book called Many Lives, Many Masters by Brian Weiss, and he is a classically trained psychiatrist who's written a series of books now, but the focus of his work over the years has become uh, the concept or the idea of past life regression, and that and his theory is that you go through your life with a cluster of souls that are important in your life, and you're, you're all sort of interconnected, and over multiple lifetimes, you work out whatever lessons need to be learned. And that's kind of a controversial and ooh kind of thing. <laughs> uh, and I remember going to, to see him 25 years ago when I read the book. He was in St. Louis and giving a, a talk uh, because I was a therapist and I was concerned about, you know, is this a charlatan deal? Uh, and, and it was fascinating because his argument was that uh, you look to see when, when you do therapy this way and you use this concept in therapy, you look to see if people get better. You don't, you, you don't fight with them over whether it's true or not true or real or not real or what have you. And so Kathy and I have been talking about that because we're going to go and, and see him again at a, at a conference in the very near future. Uh, and then uh, an article came out in Missouri Medicine, which is mm -hmm. a, a journal for physicians in Missouri, okay. and they are dedicating uh, several articles over the next several months on the topics of death and the death experience and what, what are called near-death experiences. The article talks about the fact that medical capacities have improved so that people who years ago would have died and, and not come back, are be, medicine is able to stop them in the dying process and they come back, whether they're resuscitated or revived or whether they come back, you know, who knows. But th what's fascinating about that is the increasing number of people that have had near-death experience. Mm -hmm. And the article talks about something called a shared death mm -hmm. experience. Uh, and so we want to talk about that. What is it? What do people say? What, what are the stories? What do they have in common? The, the, the stories are amazingly similar across cultures, across religions, uh, from different parts of the world. If you've had a near-death experience and you come back and relate what your experience has been, the, the details and specifics of that relating are awesomely similar. Mm -hmm. uh, That's the way Brian Weiss ties into this. Mm -hmm. Near-death experiences are more accepted than what Brian talks about. Absolutely. Near-death experiences are d patients who have gone to the edge, mm -hmm. usually seen the light or seen themselves from above and been disconnected their soul from their body mm -hmm. and then come back. Yeah, Brian where Weiss, medicine would say they're dead and then all of a sudden they're not dead. Right. Yeah. But Brian, what Brian Weiss is doing, he's a regression psychiatrist. He regresses people back to a previous life mm -hmm. because they have fears in this life that don't make sense. They have phobias. They have, I mean, phobias that they can't go outside. They, they are afraid of snakes. They're afraid they of swimming. They can't go yes. swimming. They're afraid of getting in a boat. They're afraid of being choked. They feel choked. They, mm -hmm. they wake up with dreams of being choked. What he did in, in short was he found this and he didn't, he almost didn't believe it. He didn't believe His it, first no. patient was Catherine and he, and he has a whole book on Catherine and he, he was regressing her because she had multiple phobias and it was impairing her life. And he said, mm, I'm going to regress you back to birth because we haven't found the phobia yet. He tried to get her back to birth and they jumped to another life. And he's like, whoa, they're, and this whole time they're hypnotized. So this is, this is one thing, life after life right. with the same soul. Right. And then near death doesn't really talk about life after life. It just talks about the life after life on earth. Mm -hmm. and getting there and coming back. Mm -hmm. So some of these things we've experienced ourselves, so, at least I have, and I've experienced it personally. Mm -hmm. And I've never, I had never read a book about 
dying and, and returning. And I hadn't read Brian Weiss's book either. Well, and so. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross is, is one of the standard sources in the field mm -hmm. of near-death experiences or, or uh, dying and coming back. And she became interested and did research all over the world and went to every different religious area and every, and all the continents and accumulated hundreds of stories of people that had died and mm -hmm. come back. And they all had similar experiences. The, the experience of leaving their body, having a level of awareness. Sometimes they, they relate that they, they're in the emergency room, people are operating on them, they have the sense that they're up above mm -hmm. watching it, and they're aware of conversations and procedures that are going on in the emergency room, but also out in the hallway you know, with their relatives or their loved mm -hmm. ones who are concerned and Listening things that they're saying. And, and they, they have a sense of uh, overarching knowledge and compassion. And then they get sort of sucked into a, a tunnel. There's a, a, a loud wind sensation, a sense of movement, traveling towards a light. Then they come into the presence of this light and they experience this uh, incredible, unbelievable aura of peace and love. happiness and love. And sometimes there's a, an, a, a vision of a being. Sometimes there's just the light. Sometimes there's a voice. Uh, sometimes they're told, you're not finished yet, you have to go back. Sometimes they're asked if they want to go back and they want to stay there, but they have children or they have somebody they feel that needs them and they decide to come back. And then they, they come back, they wake up. And those stories are phenomenally similar. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and my, mine was after surgery, mm -hmm. and I had had um, an anesthesia issue of some type that no one understood, and I still don't mm -hmm. know what happened, neither mm -hmm. do they. It was a meant to be kind of thing. So after, my, after a surgery in 2002, after my hysterectomy, they, um, they couldn't get me to breathe again. My O2 went down. They thought I had brain damage. And they intubated me again in the recovery room, but I was so swollen. They gave me so much fluid to resuscitate me that I looked like a marshmallow. They couldn't get the tube down. They put a pediatric tube down. So I was br breathed by um, a respirator, put in a unit. And then I didn't know any of this, of course. You don't you're, know any of it. Unconscious. And I don't know exactly when this happened. I think it happened right before I woke up. But um, I was in the unit, and I, and I was, you usually sedate people until morning and let the machine do its work and let the body rest. Mm -hmm. But I was going into ARDS, which is usually where your lung function fills with, with fluid and you don't ever come back and you die, basically. So I was in that stage of being sick. And um, they t sent my family home against their will. And um, they, I woke up at 4 o'clock in the morning. I shouldn't have woken up. Nobody p predicted that. And I knew where I was then, and I thought I had a heart attack probably. And so I couldn't get this, the nurses. So, and this leads up, this matters because it leads up to what happened. But I couldn't get the nurses, so I started kicking my feet because I thought EKG will go off. And I felt like I was choking, mm -hmm. and I didn't know where I was, and so and my hands were bound, and my feet were bound. Right. So the nurses walked in and didn't look at me. Now these were nurses that weren't the hospital's usual nurses. We were having a nursing strike at the time, mm. and we had nurses that were from actually another country. So mm -hmm. they came in, they fixed everything, and they walked out, but they never once looked at me because mm -hmm. I was pleading with my eyes to well, try yeah, to and get they were, them. They were thinking you were dying me. anyway, so you know. Yeah. So. But I had never walked into a comatose patient's room without talking to him mm -hmm. or her. That's just not something you do when mm -hmm. you're in medicine because they could be listening. Right. So, so at that point, I was at the most alone I'd ever been in my whole life. I was tied down. I was miserable. It was right before Easter. I'd been memorizing um, Romans 8.38. And, I, and that's what I just kept saying to myself. You know, neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things to come nor things in the past can separate you from the love of God. And I kept saying that over and over and I kept, I, I just basically couldn't stand it anymore. So I gave up. I said, I, I'm done. Get me out of here. I'm done. I can't do this. And I don't want to live as a, as a cardiac cripple. Mm -hmm. So, um, so then I was gone. I was out and I was free. And when I woke up, I was covered in white and Christ was in front of me. And I couldn't see his face, of course. The light was behind him. And he was covered in the white. And the white that was on his gown covered me up. So I was lying like with face down at his feet. 
And then I began to argue with him because he told me I had to go back. That's the Sicilian that's, in you. That's, yeah. yeah, that's my problem, personal problem. <laughs> but I knew it was him. He did, I didn't hear speech. I heard telepathy. I knew he felt he, he kind of was humored that I was arguing with him because, of course, he's all-knowing, all-powerful. Uh, all so, but I, had, I felt like I had everyone I ever met that I loved right there. They were surrounding me. It was a great feeling. It was not a bad feeling. Death is not something to be afraid of. But he was, he was there saying, I have something for you to do. I have something I have planned for you. And you have to go back. Now, I never once thought about my family, which is terrible. <laughs> I just would love being with all of these other people that had already mm -hmm. gone ahead. And so I, went, I was back. Immediately, I was back on the respirator. Uh, respirator. I was awake. And there was a surgeon friend who's now deceased, who was undoing my hands and taking out the tube and extubating me, mm -hmm. and everything had reversed. I mean, everything. Like my, I, 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 they said my foley was empty. You know, the urine mm -hmm. output had gone down to nothing. All of a sudden, it filled up twice. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything reversed completely. Fluid got out of your lungs. Yeah, mm -hmm. my lungs were cured. I don't, you know, maybe I have brain damage. Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> But, um, but that was the most, that was the most sentinel one thing in my life because I wasn't afraid of death anymore. The problem with that is you want to die. Mm. It takes you months. Because you want to go to that place. Because so you want to go there. Money. You want to go back. Mm -hmm. You still remember it so closely. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's one of those things that was inhibiting me getting back into life. The other thing was I had no hormones. <laughs> And I felt absolutely terrible. Mm -hmm. and, and so that was, that was my problem, arguing with God again. I came back for this. Right. <laughs> I mean, yeah. really. And so, but, you know, he has a sense of humor. And so finally, when I gave up and asked, and asked him, I got my answer through Gino Tutera, who treated me and trained me. And then I have a new life. Mm -hmm. And now I know what he wants me to do. Well, Part of that was the book, too. But, but that's... What this article in Missouri Medicine talks about is that the people who have this experience, this near-death experience, come back with a sense of a purpose or direction for what they need to do or what they want to do. Mm -hmm. And it's not always what they had focused themselves on before. It's not like they necessarily change a, a career, but their sense of what's important and what they that value changes, totally. is changed uh, because they have a level of awareness or knowledge that, that moves them along a path uh, that's healing for them. But there's many things that have happened to me that aren't explainable. Well, yeah. But, I mean, in a big way, like the doctor that came to unhook me, he's mm -hmm. not on staff at that hospital. He had awakened in the middle of the night from a dream where his mother, who'd been dead since he was 16, woke him up and told him to come to the hospital to unhook the you know, respirator. Now, and, he'd, and I wouldn't have told that story because if he were living. Right. But when... <laughs> Because he's no longer, he died six months later of a heart attack. Right. And he was only 48. But, had he, but he sit, leaned down and said, if you tell anybody this story, yeah. he said, I'll get you. You know, yeah. So, yeah. so I feel safe in telling, because he, he thought they, everyone would think he was crazy. Sure. sure. But it p perfectly ties in. I, but, you know, I've talked to people that have had similar experiences, mm -hmm. that, that someone that has predeceased them comes back and talks to them. My, my mother, mm -hmm. when her husband died, she told me years later that for the first week after he died, every night when she went to bed and went to sleep, she'd wake up and he would be laying in bed next to her in the clothes that she buried him in from, from, the, from, the, from the casket. Mm -hmm. and, but that he was, he, did, he didn't move or anything except that he looked at her and talked. And they talked about all of the the problems that she needed to deal with to mm -hmm. to deal with the farm to sell the farm to take care of the children what it, whatever mm -hmm. it might be and and so she and I had conversations I'm very skeptical about this yeah. kind of stuff I've never personally experienced it and I'm kind of <laughs> like yeah right uh, <laughs> but you know whether it was a, a, an artifact that allowed her to frame her thought process or whether he really came back and talked to her I'm not prepared to argue. I, I, I don't know. I know that she believed and that in believing it, she was comforted and more at peace with his passage mm -hmm. and more focused on what she needed to do. How you think is why no one tells you stories like this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because, because I'm a cynic? Yeah, because yeah. you're a cynic. And, yeah. and that's, that's okay, but the rest of the world's a cynic too. And that's why in a medical journal, right. 
for the, that's pretty gutsy for them to put all this in. Oh, it is. And because there's lots of stories about what doctors themselves have experienced What they in call a death. shared death experience, right. which I had not heard of until right. I read this article. And I, I don't believe... I've been part of that. I was well, I was in the birth part. To tell our listeners what that is. A near or a, a shared death experience is where you are you can witness them dying. You're in you can, the room. You're in the room, you can witness them leaving. You can you I mean you can they're leaving their body mm-hmm. or you're seeing someone to take them right. to bring them to the next life or to to the to heaven and you can Or you experience the light and right? the sense of overwhelming peace and calmness. There's a, a connection to the stories that people tell, that they relate when they come back. That connective experience is reported by family members, physicians, nurses, the people that were present at the moment of death mm-hmm. uh, as, as, and recovery. I mean, they, they can all talk about it later. They all knew and felt and heard similar things at the same time. I've had, I've had spiritual experiences since I was a child, weird, different, unusual not seen by anybody else, and mm-hmm. which would make me crazy, but I'm not. I mean, in doctor's eyes, generally, mm-hmm. would mean that that's why you don't tell anybody. Yeah. Because you're you afraid have, of you being labeled spirit- as crazy. Yeah, you have spiritual that can't be explained by anything except being a, a, another dimension, another mm-hmm. another site, mm-hmm. and those are things that are gifts, but. I don't have, I can't tell the future, none of that. It's just weird little things that have happened. Our culture, the American culture, is a culture that really has problems with death. Yeah. And the cultural evolution of how we handle death. You know, we send people to the hospital to die. Death becomes sterile. It's not a family experience. It's not a shared it used to be. experience. It used to be generations ago, but it, it typically is not mm-hmm. now. Although it's coming back. There are, there are, uh, th- there are magazines and journals and th- there's a movement to get people to bring their loved ones home to die mm-hmm. and be with them and care for them mm-hmm. as they die. Uh, we have to change some of the way insurance pays and some of the way government regulations and so on. There's, there's an interesting article in here mm-hmm. a physician is writing about the death of his friend and he said that for years his friend who was a, a heart surgeon had had conversations with him about when it comes to be my time to die, I don't want extreme measures done. Mm-hmm. I don't want to be intubated and put on a respirator. I don't want this. I don't want this. I don't want this. Uh, and this friend who was a doctor was this doctor's patient. And so he had all that conversation documented in the patient's records. The friend had a stroke. His wife and family were not around. They took him wherever he was, took him to the hospital. The hospital immediately hooked him up to all of this The friend, stuff. not the heart doctor, the, or the heart the, doctor. The heart doctor who had said, I okay. don't ever want right. this done. Mm-hmm. So when this doctor who's writing the article was called, your patient friend is in the hospital, in extremis, he's got all these problems, went to the hospital, he took the documentation with him. Mm-hmm. And he had a conversation with the family. He said, look, here, here's what he said to me over and over again. And the family agreed, and they unhooked the, the equipment, and his friend went into a coma and died the way he wanted to die. And he says in the article that one of the nurses that worked at the hospital brought charges against him for murder, for, mm-hmm. for killing the doctor. And he said it, it was fine. It all worked out. They had the documentation. The family was supportive. Nothing bad happened. But he says his point is that a lot of physicians won't follow the path he followed because they're, they're afraid. afraid of the consequences mm-hmm. of the law or mm-hmm. the families or the distress that people will mm-hmm. feel uh, for their patients. But more and more of them are choosing to die that way. More physicians are choosing, choosing to die that way. We're choosing to die that for way. For their own right. death. Uh, and it's, it's a real interesting conundrum in medicine that these guys who know all that medicine can do and exactly how it is done and who have the, because they're physicians in hospitals, have the ability to access that, mm-hmm. the, the cost isn't so much a factor, mm-hmm. uh, are choosing not to access it. Well, even the cost is, is a factor to somebody, but the f- cost isn't a factor to them. Right. Because they don't want that, they know what kind of torture People well, are put through. And the cost-benefit ratio, for what? For a week more, a month more? Well, they don't want to be on a respirator and be out of control. That's another issue. Doctors have to be in control. I've noticed that. Really? Okay. So, 
<laughs> so they'd rather be in control of their own death, and I, I, I kind of applaud that, yeah. rather than be at the mercy of a machine, and I applaud that, but the question is, would that same doctor give their own patient that same, that, that in, same information care? Information, advice, and encouragement. Yeah, I guess yeah. It's, there's lots of reasons why that wouldn't happen, but... Well, there are, and I, want, I don't want to get lost in the thicket. The, the yeah. global <laughs> conversation we're having is about the death and dying process and our understanding of it as a a phase or a step in life and mm -hmm. a part of life. It is part and, of life. And trying to get some meaning about that as opposed to the specific mechanical process of dying or mm -hmm. being dead. And uh, the purpose of medicine in general is to keep people alive. Right. And that's where we get the disconnect yeah. between keeping people alive and keeping people in a quality life. Mm -hmm. Because the, the mission, the mission is just to keep people alive. Yeah. And, and that mission isn't enough. And so if all of our studies and all of our research and all of our uh, cholesterol medicines and everything else just are to make our lives longer but not better, not useful, not participatory, just to get us into a nursing home for 20 years, then that's failure to me. But that's what every doctor's taught. You are taught to keep a life going. Mm -hmm. And so it's very hard to think about this and to think this way as a physician unless you're thinking about it for yourself. Right. Because our goal with our patients is something different than our goal with ourselves. I mean, it is. Yeah. And so we can have personal And your role goals. is different. And, and, and it our needs role to be is different. different. But, but the conversation that they're trying to have in Missouri Medicine is how do we define that role and progress towards the betterment of it. Right. So. That's right. And so, and this is just a very time has come uh, movement. movement and yeah. article. And it's just one of the doctors here has written a book on near death. It's called Life After Life. And it's um, written by Moody, mm -hmm. Dr. Moody. And so that would be something if you are interested in that. Right. It's, um, it's from a doctor's perspective. But, but I, I guess, too, you know, lawyer talk at the end. Have conversations with your family and loved ones about what they want. Document that. Get the forms and the paperwork filled out so that when the time comes, the people that you've entrusted to do what you want done are legally able to do what you want done. So right. think about what you want done. I mean, in, in, ter in, in, in terms the state of Missouri, you, you, can draw, you can download from the Bar Association. Yeah. You can download your health care uh, initiative. Mm -hmm. Is that what it's called? Durable power. Dur durable power of attorney. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just For health care decisions. Yeah. For healthcare. So you can download that and fill it out yourself. You just have to have it notarized. And somebody has to know where it is and have to yeah. have copies of it. Multiple <laughs> copies of it. Because yeah. when you go to the hospital, every time you have to take somebody to the hospital or every time you go back, they want you to have another copy of it, even though it's in their files. Have your little packet by the back door. Just <laughs> have it case. on your smartphone. Have, yeah. Just be ready. Yeah. It's easier now. Yeah. But that's something that they have to have before they put you on a respirator. Now, the way I was on a respirator wouldn't have been, if I had said, I don't want to be on a respirator, they would have still put me on a respirator because I wasn't really at risk of dying at that point. Right. So you still go onto a respirator if you need it and they think there's a chance you'll live. Mm -hmm. But if they know there's an option there's, to turn it off, it's terminal or it's, it's over, right. then, then they can turn it off. Okay. So, this is, this is a very spiritual yet very practical yes. kind of approach to this. Yeah. And we aren't speaking about, we aren't really speaking about what we believe, although my story does have content in it about what I believe. Right. And, um, but there's room for all kinds of different beliefs in this. Every, it's gone through history and through all over the world that people have experienced this, there is something after life. Well, and whatever your beliefs are, there are practical, legal, and medical reasons for obtaining information and making decisions so that other people know what you want. That's right. Thank, Thank you. you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. 
Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.